Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. of light, we've seen triangles, we've seen cigar-shaped objects. Is it something from another planet, like everybody would, would like to find out? It was as if you'd gone through a into a different time zone and, and popped back out again. They have had a, a, a what's called a time dilation effect, or a missing time effect, but there's a period of time that they can't account for. These stories are some of the strangest experiences ever described in the UK. We can't tell if they're true, but they are all recounted by ordinary people. Now, they are your witnesses. Bonnie Bridge in Scotland is a village with an unusual claim. In the last few years, it has become the UFO capital of the UK. Thousands of strange objects have been spotted in the skies above the village. Are they visitors from outer space, or is there a more straightforward explanation? One man has become determined to provide proof that there is an extraordinary reason behind these celestial phenomena. I would say the first major time was when we got it on video was in 1991, when my brother came into the house and said, I've seen something, something's chased me type of thing. So we were like, yeah, hi, okay, fine. And we went outside and true enough, there was this thing flying about in the skies and it was doing like a, a figure of eight in the sky moving about. And it looked really bizarre looking. As we watched it, we actually watched like balls of light coming out of the back of it and flying away from this object. So that eliminated like obviously aircraft, helicopter, blah, 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 because there was no noise or anything off it at the time. So that's the very, very first sign that I can say we've got concrete proof that there's something strange. So that's how it all started. Bonnie Bridge, certainly over these last few years, has been probably the centre of UFO sightings in the UK. We often use the term window area. For, for something like Bonnie Bridge. It's a small geographical area where a lot of things seem to happen. There are others around the country. Uh, Bonnie Bridge seems to be the current one. Now, why this happens, why it should be in this one particular area, is anyone's guess. But the fact that it is, uh, and we just have to live with that. Uh, but there are other areas around the country, and indeed around the world, that seem to have a, a concentration of strange things happening, not just UFO sighting, but a whole host of things. There was one night in question I'd just actually finished work and it was at the back door of the house. It was approximately six o'clock at night and my dad, it was November, and my dad had shouted me, there's something in the sky just at the back of the house. So we started to watch this, like, it wasn't just one, it was, there was two or three of them, like balls of light doing kind of acrobatics in the sky. And the next thing there was like helicopters appeared like unmarked helicopters and the helicopters they seem to be chasing the balls of light it was like cat and mouse there does seem to be one or two individuals that for whatever reason are in the right place at the right time to make these observations sometimes it's because of their profession for example police officers are often out at night and so on when a lot of sightings are made so it wouldn't surprise me if, if a police constable or, or whatever made a few sightings in a particular area, especially if there were a lot of sightings in that area at the time, the odds must be in his favour. Um, but it's, it's, it's not uncommon for some individuals to be around at the right time, whether they're tuning in to something or it's just pure luck um, is another argument, of course. From the first one, it just snowballed. We've seen dozens and dozens within a matter of six months or so, we've seen loads and loads of balls of light, we've seen triangles, we've seen cigar-shaped objects, you've seen lights bouncing about in the sky, like 
absolutely no way it's aircraft. Do some people actually see more UFOs? Or are they just more willing to believe in extraordinary explanations for everyday events? Friend of the family, John Wilson, was skeptical until one night a few years ago. We were leaving the house to go home. Craig spotted it and it was over at the back there. So we all come out the house and we all walked over to the gates and there it was. It was bright, like a bright ball. And I mean, nothing moves as fast as that and comes back and goes up and down as fast as that, do you know? So, and then after seeing it on the video, do you know, it, it does look like it is obviously something that needs to be investigated, you know? With all the, the commotion, Jim was saying, oh, look, and Craig's camcording it, and my daughter's gripping my arm because I think she was a bit frightened, you know? But after a while, after we watched it all, and it just, Truff, just shot from off from nowhere, you know, gone. It wasn't just there and then it vanished. It was there for a good quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, I'd say. We're all mes mesmerised by it because I'd never seen anything like that before. My daughter hadn't. Obviously, Jim and I've, and Craig has, you know, and it's all on 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 the tape, on the the camcorder, you know. I mean, they, they even hear me swearing like mad because I've never seen anything like that. There's nothing that would would pinpoint Bonnie Bridge to be a, a, a you know an attraction for UFOs or any kind of other phenomena, and the same goes for other window areas. Uh, like I said, there's many of them around the around the world, but there doesn't seem to be any particular reason why or reason that we currently understand uh, why they should have a concentration in just one small area. So why Bonnie Bridge? There are several airports in the area. Could this explain the sightings? When you go out sky watching, it's a process of an elimination type of thing. I mean, aircraft, you know aircraft, you can hear them, you know the lights on them, you know the colour of lights on them. Helicopters again, you can hear them, they've got lights on them, you know the colours. As well as strange lights, oddly shaped objects have also appeared. The cigar shaped one that I've got in video, it was actually, again, we were just sitting in the house, me and my dad and my mum, and it was my brother uh, that came into the house and says, you're going to have to come and see this. The movement of the cigar-shaped object was nil. It was just, like, sitting in the sky. And it, was, it wasn't sitting in a straight line. It was sitting, like, in a, a horizontal type of shape. It was, it, was, it was weird. It was offset in the sky. But I, I was... That was one of the weirdest ones. I mean, it was quite close as well. But again, it's hard to judge how close and how big it is because it's in the sky. You've not got anything to kind of, like, any backing to judge size or scale on it. Most sightings, if not all sightings, of lights in the sky, irrespective of whether they're backed up by, by video or film footage, have a conventional explanation. The vast majority of them, without question, are aircraft. The, the next category are known astronomical uh, observations, stars, planets, and so on. Uh, and I've no reason to believe that just because, you know, he's made a lot of sightings or filmed a lot of these things, that should be any different. During his nighttime vigils, Craig has captured hundreds of these objects on video. He has also experienced another strange phenomenon, sudden unexplained equipment failure. You're trying to capture something on video that you're no one else is seen, and you're intrigued to try and, you push yourself to the limits to try and get this, but it's very difficult because it, it can be frustrating because you're standing there all geared up with your, your camera and everything ready to roll, and you, you start taking your pictures or your, your camcorder and then the battery just goes bump, and that's it. There's absolutely no power in it, and it's happened several occasions, even with brand new batteries. The reason for it, for the batteries going flat, I have no idea. It could be like power surges or whatever. I mean, I really don't know. I mean, it could just be faulty batteries, but I wouldn't say, like, maybe, I think it's possible that 10 batteries have maybe bought over the years. I wouldn't say 10 batteries would just go knackered within 10 seconds of the first time we've ever used them. Could this just be a coincidence? 
most UFO sightings happen spontaneously. You're not prepared for it. So you grab your, if you've, you know, you've got the wherewithal to grab your camera, you do, oh, I have no film in it. Oh, the battery is low, and so on. So, you know, you're putting two, two, two and two together and making five sometimes, but uh, I think it's just because we're not prepared for it. And um, it's very easy to, to put a spooky atmosphere around this. And I just went to film it and my battery ran out. It must have been the aliens. Well, I'm afraid not. It's probably because you hadn't charged it beforehand. It's as simple as that. Strange objects can still be seen in the skies above Bonnie Bridge. Many people want to believe they are UFOs, visitors from outer space, or even top secret military aircraft. Craig Malcolm continues to scan the skies with his camera, hoping one day to find and prove beyond all doubt the true cause of these events. Before the sighting, we used to see odd things in the sky, but you never took really much notice. You know, you, it's like talking to Craig and Jim what they'd seen, you know, and then the night that I did see it, it was, it was unbelievable. It was as if you'd gone through a into a different time zone and, and popped back out again. They have had a, 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 what's called a time dilation effect or a missing time effect. There's a period of time that they can't account for. Time slip, a bizarre phenomenon, the apparent distortion of time. Is time travel possible, or is it all in the mind? Caltebragan training camp at Cymru in Scotland, and in the summer of 1993, home to Army Cadet trainer Sue Underhill. It was the 8th of August, and the day was absolutely frantic. Everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong, and it was half past two on the 8th before we managed to get a book out at the guardroom and get out of camp. I drove out of camp. I knew the roads fairly well. I'd actually wrecked the campsite. So I maybe just exceeded the speed limit a little bit <laughs> um, because they're not the best of roads, but I was familiar with them. And I'd been out to the cadets on the campsite anyway. So I flew down and to Killing, um, the village where you turn off to go down the tiny road down the other side of Loch Tay. We were already getting very late. Sue and her colleague David Hardy were heading to the Aberfoyle Visitors Centre, 40 miles away. They had to be there by quarter to four. David took over the driving while Sue nodded off in the passenger seat. The next thing I remember, which seemed an instant later, but you know what it's like when you've been short of sleep for days. David said, Sue, where's Owen? Oh, it's a fishing town on the west coast. Why? Oh, we're five miles away from it. <laughs> and sure enough, he'd stopped and reversed up and there was a sign. Hoban, five miles. There's no way we're going to get back in time. Just turn around and head back, you know. It's straight back, you know. We, we must be on the right road. If we go back the way we've come, we're going to get back to where we started from. So he turned around and we nattered away. And, I mean, we didn't idle, but um, we weren't sort of belting along because we knew there was absolutely no hope of getting back. And we came across Locker and Head, and I said, oh, we'll go straight by, um, we'd better go to the visitor centre and you know, just leave a message. He's going to wonder what has happened. And I looked at my watch as we approached the visitor centre turning, and it was only quarter past three. <laughs> We'd left our camp at half past two. <laughs> If you, later when we looked at the map, it's sort of a round trip of about 153 miles. <laughs> How had they managed to cover 150 miles in just three quarters of an hour? Albert Button, a researcher into the effects of electromagnetic fields, may have an answer. They feel that a short period of time has elapsed and an enormous amount of activity has occurred. Um, this is desynchronization. In actual fact, a normal amount of time has occurred, but their perception of it is distorted. But why should they even perceive time to be distorted? I find it uh, very interesting that um, these two people spent 
all of their life living on military bases because the military produced powerful communication systems and uh, radar, which is, is pulse microwaves, and they would have been exposed to higher levels of electromagnetic pollution than the average person, which would sensitize them to electromagnetic fields in the environment. So this is a, a very a key factor in their uh, sensitization. Only two days earlier, Sue and David had come across other evidence of a strong magnetic field. We saw a lot of lights ahead of us. And as we got near it, there were eyes. And we pulled up, and there must have been, oh, I don't know, I mean, I'd say probably 40 or 50, I might be exaggerating, but there seemed that density of cats. All different sort of sizes, some seemed quite large. And they were sitting around, totally ignoring us, but they were right across the road, in, with them in circle just before the turning to the junction. And I mean, we couldn't go, they, they were there sort of two or three minutes and then they also got up and strolled off their different ways. Um, seemed absolutely weird <laughs> to me, uh, but apparently I've heard since that um, there was probably a magnetic field there and they love it and they'd all be attracted to it again, sit there and do whatever cats do. Yes, uh, Susan Underhill and David Hardy um, produced a, a report on some unusual experiences that they had when they went um, driving through parts of Scotland. Um, looking at the areas that they, uh, they covered, um, I can see that um, most of the area is on the Highland Boundary Fault. I talked about um, geological faults and the energies that these can produce at the surface. Um, they were actually in a highly faulted area that is riven by dip and strike faults um, producing piezoelectric, piezomagnetic fields at the surface, driving through these, produce all kinds of anomalous effects. Could these geological faults produce fields that disrupt perception of time? Sue and David thought little more of it until one evening at the same camp two years later. At half past nine, went and checked on the guard, booked out and drove out of camp. And we headed off for Calendar, where there's a Chinese restaurant and we spent a, a good hour over a meal, I would think. Um, they, I mean, I knew we'd left camp at half past nine because of booking out. And we hadn't hurried to calendar. But I know as we left the restaurant, it was quarter to twelve. And we set off, walked to the car, drove out of calendar. And it was one of those magical clear nights that you, you really only get in, in Scotland and the moon shining down on Loch Lednig was spectacular. I drew David's attention to it. Of course, when you're driving, you can't really appreciate these things quite as well. And I was still, I, I think, admiring the moon's reflection when David went into complete panic, jammed the brakes on, skidded the car to a halt, and there in front of us was our famous sign that we'd seen two years before. Open, five miles. Somehow, they had arrived at the same sign over 70 miles away. But this time, as they drove back, they seemed to be on a different road they had never seen before. It was really very, quite spooky. And we seemed to drive forever and ever and ever. <laughs> And eventually we came to a, a, a little village and a railway bridge. And it was quite a long railway bridge. You went round a corner actually under the bridge. It was quite a, quite a width of bridge. And I've never seen it before. The only railway bridge over that road had been demolished in 1965. As they came out from under the bridge, Sue recognised where they were. And as we came out of the other side, I realised we were actually at Loch Earnhead. And it's, David had, had gone past it, we had to reverse up, because the turning wasn't like it should have been. It wasn't a big turning with um, your white lines in the middle of the road for sort of right turn and keep left signs and things. It was only a little turning with no white lines at all. And it was no old-fashioned sign. And we thought it was probably a different road. 
I said, look, let's go somewhere we know. <laughs> let's turn down it. So we turned down and um, drove along, and we were beside the lock. And the lock was, lock end was on our right hand side, so it had to be the right road. But there was sort of white painted fence down the road beside us, between us and the lock. The road hadn't looked like that for at least 30 years. There was still no, no sign of cars anywhere, no cars parked outside the houses or anything. It was quite really weird. And it wasn't until we got back to Comrie and to the fish farm, just as you turn into Comrie, that the street lights were there and everything was... Love me hell, everything was just normal. Areas that they drove through seem strange and unreal. Um, this is uh, another effect that is also very well documented in the neurological literature called jamais vu, which is the opposite of déjà vu. Déjà vu is where you, something happens to you and you feel that it's quite familiar. Jamais vu is the reverse, where you feel that things are strange. Were Sue and David somehow seeing images of the past? Driving 70 miles back from Oban, they expected to get to camp in the early hours of the morning. But when they arrived, they found the gates still unlocked. And we drove back into camp, and David was really annoyed because the camp gates were still unlocked. And it is a rule that they lock the gates up, up at night. David, David wound the window, let the window down and to book back in. His guard came up, they, you, you have to book in as well as out of camp. And uh, the RSM came out of the guardroom and said, it's not time to lock the gates yet. And we told him what had happened. And he just couldn't believe it because, of course, he remembered the, on Sunday the 8th of August, two years before, we'd gone, got lost, we thought, and, and ended up just outside Oban. And here we were, outside Oban again. It was as if you'd gone through a into a different time zone and, and pop back out again. Sue and David had again covered the distance in an impossible time. Had they also travelled back 30 years? Or is it all the work of electromagnetic fields and jamais vu? I didn't really, really realise that we had lost time. I, it was just incredible because we seemed to have been walking backwards in time. Obviously, now it's amazing that, that knowing how or what the distance we must have travelled, but at the time it seemed perfectly acceptable. 